Angelica actually feels a little bit like a navigation plant to me mm -hmm. in that it moves the waters of the body, right? And I feel like the way that it grows in different areas helps me kind of navigate how to stay in circulation. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I loved this conversation with Frida, not only because she's a really cool person, but also because of all of the wide ranging and in-depth information that she shared about Angelica. I loved Angelica before this interview, and now I feel like I'm falling for it even more. And I know you're gonna love it too. For those of you who don't already know her, Frida Kapar Bay is an herbalist, movement artist, writer, and educator. She began her formal study of the plants at the California School of Herbal Studies. She went on to apprentice with the Herbal Apothecary for two years, studied with Aviva Ram and Matthew Wood, and seed taproot medicine, a small line of potent herbal syrups. As she began working clinically, she found the need for more diagnostic skill, and over the next four years, embarked on a journey into reading the tongue, pulse, and face, primarily under the direction of acupuncturists Brian LaForgia and Will Morris. This work has brought her to her current study of Taoist medicine of theory, Qigong, and Taoist dream diagnosis. She has volunteered as a part of the MASH Collective, the Botanical Bus, and the People's Medicine Project, and taught advanced coursework through Gathering Time Herb School, Scarlet Sage, and her own apprenticeships. It sounds like a lot, but most of her days include at least one long conversation with a plant and many awe-filled moments as a parent. Well, welcome to the show, Frida. It's so lovely to have you here. Hmm, thank you. It's so fun to be here already. Well, people find their way onto the show in different ways, and you have the distinction of you were specifically requested. Somebody wrote me, and I'm so <laughs> sorry. I don't remember who it was. It was a couple of months ago, but I kind of remember somebody was like, you're going to love her. Check her out, blah, blah, blah. And so I did, and I've been on your newsletter for a couple of months and just love all of your mm -hmm. seasonal offerings. And I'm sure we'll talk about Qigong a bit, but that's a big love of mine. So your offerings around that and just everything is, everything you do is also very beautiful, just simple and beautiful. And mm. I'm really excited to get to know you better. Mm, me too. I love that your podcast and it's, um, it's the perfect length for the half hour drive into the town. <laughs> nice. I'm glad that's yeah. cool. <laughs> Well. Yeah. I guess the great place to get started is, as always, is how did you find yourself on this plant path? Yeah, um, such a fun question because it's not, uh, I didn't go into the garden when I was six and have a like aha moment. Um, but kind of little by little, my, I would say my three things, my parents, um, both in really different ways. My dad is an immigrant here and he came from the Baltic coast. Um, so kind of otherworldly. Um, he definitely had a very different way of seeing things. And his, his acknowledgement of the plants as sentient, kind of from an early age, had a really deep effect on me. And um, I remember him, he was, a, he was a, you know, odd job guy. He would do firewood or plant trees or roofing jobs because he had immigrant status. And um, he did all this landscaping for this little historical park near our town. And he would only water the plants there with spring water, which he would drive 40 minutes to get in his old diesel car wow. and get spring water and bring it to the plants. And I remember being like, Dad, you don't have money for this gas. What are you doing? And he was like, these plants deserve the best water. Mm -hmm. And 
um, yeah, that just really stayed with me that like somebody with very little means could could really organize around something essentially sacred, you know, from this different perspective. Um, and my mom just, um, she always reached for mullen before cough syrup. Hmm. And she always reached for, you know, the homeopathic she knew about before Tylenol. So I feel like her just commitment to like trying things out, you know, she's not an herbalist, she's not a medicine woman on any level, but um, she committed herself to just trying things and, and learning about them. Um, so there was that. And then I, I started dancing at a really young age. And I often tell people like dancing has saved my life <laughs> and being, um, being in a practice of being embodied feels like it actually really opened me to the plant world hmm. through my body in a way that, um, I don't think I could know if I didn't practice that, you know what I mean? Like, and mm -hmm. Qigong is like the current way that I really practice and teach that. So um, really just like practicing being embodied, practicing being in my senses. Um, and then one other person I just want to give a shout out to, Jen Bredesen, who is, um, she's now on faculty at the California School of Herbal Studies in Sonoma County. Um, but I met her in a punk warehouse in San Francisco and she was living out of the back of her truck and making these amazing herbal beers. <laughs> and she was like making like, you know, rosemary, yarrow, mugwort beer for all the crazy punks in San Francisco in the early 2000s. And she brought me on my first seaweed harvest and she gave me my first remedies for menstrual cramps and just like a real adventure and and a real plant it's like plants are just springing out of her all the time like she's just a, she's a plant person you're like is that a plant oh no it's jen <laughs> <laughs> oh, i love that yeah so she really she really kind of gave me um the idea that you could go and be an herbalist like it wasn't just a mythological thing to be a quote witch like she really was like no you can know these things hmm. um so yeah, those are some I starting points. Yeah, I love that vision of just those plant people who live the plants so thoroughly that it just yeah. ends up, you know, engrossing everybody around them too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Well, you chose Angelica for your plant today, which I am super excited about because it is the first time Angelica has made their way onto the show. And I love Angelica and I'm excited to hear what you have to share about Angelica. And I'm also curious why Angelica was the plant you chose. Yeah, yeah. It's like the the plant that herbalists get really excited about, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know somebody who's a plant person when you mention Angelica and they're like, oh, <sighs> we all kind of like feign in Angelica's presence. Um, and yeah, I, it's funny. I, I got the the info and invite to the podcast and, and you asked like, what plant do you want to, to, to speak about? And that very night I had a dream where somebody handed me a bouquet and I was like, oh, those are Angelica blossoms. They're out of season. Where did she get them? And then I looked into her eyes and she looked kind of like me. And um, I got, I woke up with just like this, it's, this was a few weeks ago, kind of inside this veil of um, ancestry and, and, just connections of worlds, you know, dur during the, the witch's new year. And I got the sense that, that she was my ancestor. And, and I just love this plant because when I, um, when I went to the Baltic coast where my dad is from and immigrated from, and I brought his ashes back when he died. And I remember pouring his ashes into the Baltic sea and then turning around and walking back up the slope. And it was just full of Angelica. Growing kind of growing like a total weed in a way that it doesn't really grow on North America or that I've seen like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the Archangelica, like the really big, juicy ones. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I just felt caught. I was like, okay, got it. Angelica, that's what we're wow. talking about here. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, it gives me goosebumps on, I'm so glad you shared that story because, yeah, it gives me goosebumps on several levels. I don't know if you know this, Frida, but I just returned from Mexico where I um, spread my dad's ashes. So I just kind of fill you on that level and, yeah, and just to have the plant support. And um, yeah. there's been something about the whole journey of 
my dad passing and bringing his ashes back. That is the healing part is that has been community and feeling like I'm not alone in that shared experience. And yeah. so it, um, mm. for whoever else needs to hear it too, if there's something yeah. to be said about this human experience of, um, yeah, the, the next yeah. phase. And, yeah. Yeah. And did your dad, did he request like that? Like, did he want his ashes to be back in Mexico? Uh, that was, so he, I think towards the end, didn't really know that he wasn't 100% with us. And I don't think he really knew he was dying mm -hmm. um, on on one level anyway. But the only thing he said the last day he was alive was that he wanted to go back home. And so that was, it, yeah. it was absolutely the right thing to do for yeah. that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of amazing to me how we know, like, where home is in our navigational sense. And my dad, he had this really thick, um, like, northern German accent as they spoke German in East Prussia. And he would get, like, belligerent about it. He'd be like, you all have to take me back. You have to take my body back on the boat to the Baltic Sea, you know, when mm -hmm. he was still alive and kicking and jumping around and we were like dad we can't afford that what are you talking about um so when he died and we cremated him and it was just like a total no-brainer that like oh this is what this year is about for me mm -hmm. is figuring out how to get myself and my little three-year-old and my partner like to that place mm -hmm. um to honor that passing and angelica actually feels a little bit like a navigation plant to me mm -hmm. in that it moves the waters of the body, right? It's like this big, not only blood, but like blood, like circulatory lymph, plasma, everything moves the waters of everything. And I feel like the way that it grows in different areas helps, helps me kind of navigate how to stay in circulation, in relationship mm -hmm. with circulation, which is of course like mm -hmm. the key to all health. Right. Like this, I remember one of my first teachers at, at California school, Gail Julian, she used to say, stagnation is the peril of the body. Hmm. That was also in my first teachings too, because um, I began with Chinese medicine and that was very much, you know, stagnation. Uh -huh. Like you always move stagnation before right. anything else. Right, right. So. And you always start with the heart, right? Hearts first and like treating that. And Angelica enters through the heart and the liver, which is such a nice thing of like the liver moves the blood into the heart. So um, just that it enters through the liver and the heart in, in Chinese medicine from that perspective, and then also nourishes the kidneys and the large intestine. And so in a lot of ways, it feels like a, um, like a every system plant to me. Mm. Mm. So there's like something it. so evocative about the taste of Angelica that I feel it to me, it just feels like very good medicine. And I think it's brought me a lot of relief in life too. Mm -hmm. So I, I probably associated with that. There's this like kind of comfort of like, oh, this is good medicine that's going to help mm. me. But as you describe it, you know, as it entering all these different organ systems and moving things, I know there's just something about that, that it's just very yeah. comforting to have this plant that is nourishing and moving on so many levels. Yeah. It's funny you said that because I just, I was chewing on a little bit of root before we met <laughs> and I just got a nice big hit again of like, whoa, the aromatics of Angelica. Um, yeah, and it doesn't just down bear, like a lot of carminatives, right, down bear and move things down. But I feel like Angelica both down bears and up bears because it also, you know, enters again through the heart and the liver moving up and then moving down into large intestine and kidneys. So in that like true circular fashion, like not a lot of plants do that, right? I feel like yarrow or people say yarrow does that also. Um, but just the root of it and the bear medicine of it and the solar medicine, I guess Culpepper called it like the herb of the sun, which mm -hmm. is it's lovely to think about as also how I feel like it kind of opens up the pathways between the center like the kind of middle burner, the stomach, and opens up and transforms fluids into um, spirit, like from vitality into spirit in the tr mm -hmm. three treasure model, which I feel like really opens the doors to optimism hmm. um, and, and helps people um, kind of in general when, when people feel beaten down by circumstance, 
um, neglected in some level. It invigorates those of us who suffer, suffer from that kind of anxiety of like, I don't have enough. It was like a plant that really helps us like mm. understand what enough means. Mm. Um, yeah. And I also, um, I, I was writing a little bit about Angelica and just feel like um, the sentence of like Angelica mirrors our reality and then makes it livable somehow is this like, mm. oh, right. It like kind of cir circulates and harmonizes things for us to see what's really happening. Not like a, a pain reliever like ghost pipe or something where it's like numbing, but Angelica is like circulating, moving it. So, yeah, again, moving stagnation, which can lead to yeah, yeah both yeah. physical and emotional senses yeah. of pain or stagnation. Yeah. And and working so blood circulation, right? It's like a dungway, I feel I feel like, I mean, you tell me what you think, but I feel like dungway is like a little bit more of the builder, Angelica Sinensis. It like you gotta build blood, try dungway. You wanna move blood, try Archangelica. Hmm. Um and and also moves bile, so moves like bile production. There's that like bitter. It was used in all those fancy vermouth and um, French and English crazy liqueurs that people used to make. Um, also moves the blood in the uterus, and then also moves the phlegm out of the respiratory tract, um, which I find is is kind of. Um, phlegm in the respiratory tract that's left over from an infection, but also phlegm that's left over from some kind of old grief mm -hmm. um, that that doesn't really move. I have this story, my little my littlest kid who's six now, um, he came in really damp and boggy. <laughs> it's just this like puddle, puddle constitution. <laughs> and and also um, as a baby would cry at like beautiful music. Like the mm -hmm. harmonica played slowly would make him cry, like tears mm -hmm. of grief. And it was so interesting how tender he was and sensitive to those, um, to sounds or emotions around grief. And he got crazy asthma, like just ended up with like hacking asthma and Angelica and other moving warming herbs that actually move the digestion down, I feel like have helped him kind of inhabit his lungs more. Mm -hmm. and make room for all the grief that he's going to feel because that's who he is. Mm -hmm. So it's, and it's used as an asthmatic herb, like traditionally. Um, and there was also, um, I remember somebody was telling me that people used to tie angelica leaves around their kids' necks um, <laughs> to try and ward off um, evil spirits, but uh, which I translate to be like, yeah, yeah my microbes, <laughs> and bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. The volatile oils are, like you said, it's, it's like it's got such a particular scent and smell and it's kind of sweet. Mm -hmm. um, and the the place that um, that I feel like Angelica gets tripped up on is because it's in the APACA family. And the carrot family is like, oh, there's where hemlock is, right? Hemlock sits there and does have quite, I'll say, a good strong resemblance for somebody who doesn't know plants. I look at them and I'm like, how could you possibly think that that is that? Mm -hmm. But but definitely, you know, similar plant. And hemlock is, of course, like the poison of the poisons. So I feel like a lot of people kind of just back away from Angelica in general or plants that look like Angelica or Heraclium um, because, because of those families. But then I'm like, we eat carrots. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And, and dill and parsley and fennel and all these other plants. So, um, yeah. There's, there's a will, I mean, people have to have a willingness to just look at the plants closely because like you said, it's, you know, when people first start learning about plant plants, um, and my, I include myself in this too, you mm -hmm. can confuse the most different looking plants because we don't yet have the eyes to like break apart different parts or, you know, we don't know yeah. what to look for, for characteristics. Um, so like knowing a plantain versus chamomile, yeah, you know, those are two, like, have a lot of big differences. Um, yeah. But as we get like <laughs> closer and closer um, to plants that are more similar, it's, like you said, it's not impossible to tell hemlock from mm -hmm. Angelica. It's actually quite easy, but 
you do have right. to be intentional about your ability to botanize. Right. right. And that's really my sense of like how it could be a navigational tool directing us through a certain terrain, right? And the terrain might be even psychosomatic of like a rough time of feeling not enough or not actually having enough mm -hmm. and supporting us through that terrain. And, and also like attuning to the nuance of a landscape through through our navigational skills. I'm just all about, I'm just like, we just need a lot of location practices that help <laughs> us locate ourselves and ourselves. Hmm. So I love that. I haven't heard that um, being spoken about Angelica before, but now I'm excited for this whole other level. Yeah. Um, I normally grow Angelica in my garden and for, you know, um, I don't have it currently in my garden so that I'm definitely going to fix that next spring when it's mm -hmm. the growing season again, uh, because I'm used to having it there. I've seen it growing wild, like you explained, um, like seeing, you know, banks of it in Iceland. But yeah. other than that, I, you know, and then I see it at herbal botanical gardens, but it's not yeah. a plant that I run across often. Yeah. So, so I learned that it grows naturally and natively around the Baltic Sea. So kind of from the Baltic states, Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia, and then comes up through Scandinavia all the way through the top of Norway and Iceland. But it likes cold and it likes mm. damp, which mm. is yin, right? And I'm like, oh, I love, I love working with plants who tell me what they do based on where they live. Hmm. And Arcan and so we're talking about Archangelica. There are something like, I think it's disputed, somewhere between 50 and 90 different species of Angelicas across the whole world that people know about. Um, and I feel like, kind of like oaks, they're still evolving. So there's new species that'll sort of show up. And people, that's why it's like, is it 50 species? Is it 90? We don't know. Um, the APACA family is really special like that with oaks. <laughs> shapeshifters. Um, but it's cold and damp and it grows in cold climates. It's hardy to zone three, which is like nothing grows in zone three. <laughs> Angelica. Yeah. Yeah. And just that Angelica, like brilliant, beautiful, big leafy plant can grow in zone three and in Iceland and is good for conditions that are really about cold stagnation and dry. So when you need to warm and move, um, not good. It's the place where I'm like, oh yeah, if you're yin deficient and have heat signs, that's not the landscape to use Angelica in um, because it's like a hot, dry landscape. And Angelica knows what to do when things are kind of cold and damp. Mm -hmm. She knows how to warm and she knows how to move and stand, like be moving through standing water. Um, so I just try and think of people as landscapes and I'm like, okay, yeah, you're hot, dry, yin deficient, not enough chi for Angelica yet. Let's use other things for you. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so Iceland is like one of its native places. And then just to think that, so Archangelica arrived in North America in the 1600s and that those, those Northern European ancestry ancestors from Norway, you know, a lot of them came over from Norway and from Scotland um, in that time, took their seeds and dropped them in right before it froze. Angelica likes a hard freeze. So if you do, I mean, this is for kind of not, I know you know this, but if you do want to seed Angelica, it needs cold stratification. So the best thing to do is get one plant, less whoever grew it for you, <laughs> and then grow it and then have the seeds and just drop them right in the ground. And it doesn't take over here so much. I, I mean, I haven't seen big stands of it. Like you said, I've seen like, like, like she goes in like three or four or five little like friends together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'm more familiar actually with, um, with the Hendersoni and the smaller species over in the California coast. Cause I, spent most of my time in the plant world there. And she's little and grows right on the edge of the ocean where it's just frigid all the time and that wind is pushing. And those, those are the roots, the last roots I dug when I moved from California because of just extreme climate change and fire situation to Western Massachusetts. And burning those roots for that first year that I had moved I feel like it just 
let me know I was still home. Like it kind of stretched that word out for me across the, the whole country. It was like, oh yeah, okay, this is home. This smell is here too. So hmm. yeah, a real like. Or again, location shows up again. Yeah, for you. yeah, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the Sami people and the Laplanders, they used it as a shamanic journeying plant. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And then smoking it, it has a lot of uses, a lot of like magical uses beyond the whole St. Michael thing and the whole Christian crusader, like way back before all that happened. Um, yeah. It's oh, undoubtedly a powerful plant. I mean, it really grabs people's attention. Yeah. And it's hard to feel neutral about Angelica. Yeah, totally. And similar to Angelica, um, it was like one of the first instruments. So Angel Angelica and Elder are hollow, right? And so you can dry them out and they would this the Laplanders would use the Angelica as a flute. And then the California natives, the Pomo in particular, would use the um the elderberry as like a slap stick hmm. as one of the first instruments that they had. Hmm. Um, one of the elders just told me about that, which is so cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So many, so many layers. And and also um the cardiovascular piece, working on the, the arterial network in the brain. Um, I've certainly used that with people who have had like mini strokes, like stroke after stroke or have ischemia. Um, I feel like it really restores and kind of holds the integrity of the arteries that are moving all the blood into the brain. And, um, and then Matt Wood used to say that Angelica taken in tiny doses for the people who kind of wake up at night and they're just like on high cortisol mode um, and then exhausted in the morning, helps to reset that cortisol flow and reset the endocrine levels. So again, like that fluid, the fluid of the endocrine system, the HBA axis works in that way too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, so many different so many different layers of medicine in this one plant it almost feels like a panacea in a way hmm. but then when i when i really dive into any plant i'm like oh oh you're like that too you know it's like they're all yeah. they all can do so much because they're all their own little microcosm of of the macro mm -hmm. mm, that's well put yeah i often find in having these interviews and being immersed in this plant like now I'm just like oh Angelica I need it back in my life right now <laughs> how do you like to work with Angelica teas tinctures glycerites yeah so I I definitely use it as a um as a tincture for folks when I'm doing formulations for people and just like just take your medicine and you know people who really need it on that level um I, I do like to burn it. I feel like it's the smell of the cut up root is so particular. And so, um, yeah, I, I've used it a lot in, in different ceremonies. The Lakota people use it in, in EP ceremonies and I've been in there and kind of associate that smell with that ritual. And, um, and it feels like, again, like it's a clearing of stagnation and negative energy, kind of making way for something clear to arise from that middle burner. Um, so I use it like that. And then I am, I'm somebody who's just like medicine should taste good. <laughs> and so I use it in honeys. I love using the fresh Angelica and soaking it honey and then either just having the honey or like the recipe, like making these little kind of like candy chewing chunks and then chew on them. Um, the ginseng family in general, like American ginseng, Aurelia, Dongwai, Archangelica, I use, I use all those in that way. Let's talk about your candied Angelica recipe. It's a nice segue for that. Um, yeah. So I love candied Angelica. It's an old, old way to appreciate and enjoy Angelica. So um, yeah, I'm excited yeah. to share about this. Yeah, well, and when I was when I was visiting and dropping off Dad's ashes, <laughs> um, the two cool things in in the um, Russian Baltic culture that I was steeped in at that point were um, tanks of kvass on the streets. They had like street cars, and they just have like a keg of kvass, <laughs> and you could go get a little shot of it for your day. 
Um, and then also the candied angelica. So the candied angelica stems feel like really like an Eastern European, Northern European like delicacy. Um, and so that's where I got the idea of, of the candied root. And it's not technically candied because that's a lot of sugar and different kind of preservative. Um, so these are soaked in honey, basically. Mm. And um, I have tended to use fresh angelica for this, um, but you could use dry too, and you could get the dry, because now it's not the season to be digging, but you could get the dried angelica root. And just, I tend to spray it with a tiny bit of alcohol just to kind of bring out the resins and start to break up the density and then just leave it in honey. And, you know, it's, it's hard to, to even call it a recipe because it's like, take the angelic root, pour the honey on top and enjoy. <laughs> That's my kind of recipe. Yeah, totally. It's simple, delicious, fun. Yeah. But the difference is... Um, actually eating the candied angelica root, like the root that's gotten soaked and really hydrated in the honey, and then chewing that up daily through the winter. I mean, especially when I had babies and was nursing, you know, it was like, whew, I need some heat here. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really warming and hydrating. So, but you could also just strain off the honey from the root and then just have this beautiful kind of like dark, mm. um, it's not bitter because it's honey, but angelica root is a bitter and it's a little acrid. So it's like, tastes like bear honey or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a great way to describe yeah. that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Matt does call it, Matt Wood does call it bear medicine. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think I'm like bear or elk because <laughs> the other ginseng family plants are thought of as more elk medicine. Um, which goes with the reindeer and the Laplanders and the Sami people. Right. But yeah. Yeah. And the only people who shouldn't use Angelica are people on blood thinners because it's a blood mover mm -hmm. essentially. And there's just not quite enough research. I mean, Angelica is a little obscure, so there's probably no research actually in the Western world on it. Mm -hmm. But in the Chinese pharmacopoeia, it's considered food grade in terms of its safety and um, just very safe to use as long as you're using the right plant, not hemlock. Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, so people on blood thinners, you know, they say people who are pregnant, although I've definitely used Angelica to help um, prevent miscarriage and, you know, calm the fetus. So I think it just depends if you're if you're in a situation where you're not quite sure to like work with somebody who knows the plant. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, otherwise really safe, good for kids, good for kids with that like cold induced asthma where it's like phlegmy and gunky, but it doesn't quite come up. Um, and even little ones who like don't know how to hawk loogies yet. <laughs> it's a, they can't it's, clear it on their own. Yeah. yeah, it's an acquired skill, it turns out. <laughs> um, so using it to help drain downwards and like drain mm. that into the stomach and help it move out. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lovely sharing about Angelica. Is there anything else? Oh, let's see. I know. I'm like, did anything that I, did I miss? Um, there's one place. Um, so... There was a conversation on, you know, Henrietta's, Henrietta Cress, her herbal site. Um, there's a little conversation about like, wait, somebody said Angelica's toxic. Is it toxic? Wait a minute. And so it turns out, so there's one, um, I think it's Atropurpurea, Angelica Atropurpurea, which is native to kind of like the Michigan down to Maryland, like East Coast, Northern East Coast. Um that they say, don't use the root um, fresh, wait till it's dried. I will say that I have definitely used that fresh and and I'm still here, but okay. um, there's, great, there's so. that's the one, <laughs> you know, if you're out in the wild and you're harvesting Angelica, which I will just say like, um, never harvest the first or even 10th plant, really take care with this plant. It's, it's a plant that um, I feel like, 
is so kind and so ready to offer and give its medicine up. But I feel like there's a real respect that's required. Like when I first met Angelica, I was like, oh, okay, let me just stand next to you and introduce myself first. Um, like so many other plants, but Angelica is also, you know, it doesn't grow in huge swaths, um, really fixes the banks of rivers, is mm -hmm. supportive in that way, is great medicine for the for the elk and the bear. Um, so being, being kind in how you harvest. But if you're doing that, the actual purpurea is the one that you may want to dry first and then use as medicine. Um, other than that, food grade, safety, you know, lovely for, for all bodies. So mm. yeah, thank you for those cautions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I often, um, my kind of with the words that come to mind when I think of Angelica, cause you know, we all have our little, like, Oh, that one is, it's supportive of, um, a warming blood tonic that clears the path for wisdom. And what I feel about that is it supports the kidneys who get, when they get drawn out of balance, go into fear, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of like pulling back and the antidote to fear is wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like Angelica really like draw, supports the kidneys and draws the path to wisdom before us. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, giving us some hope as it does so. And yeah, I think, I think that's about it for, I could go, I could go on and on, but. <laughs> that was a lot of wonderful sharings. I feel like I just fell in love with Angelica all over again myself. So yeah. thank you so much for that. And I am very excited to talk about what projects you have going on, because like I said, I've been on your email for a couple months and seeing uh, the many offerings that you have, and I've been enamored with them. So I, I want to hear what's coming up for you. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, I feel like I've been neglecting my newsletter because it's time to put the garden to sleep. <laughs> mm. um, let's see. I'm really excited. Um, I mean, the big, the thing that I'm really excited about in my own just world as a humble human um, is continuing to learn this new, nan this new landscape um, and expanding the meaning of what home means to me. I feel like belonging to a place and knowing that that we belong where we are feels like the work of this time and it's not just talking about belonging it's really like knowing what that sense is so um yeah just really for me discovering and like committing to like watching the sunrise every morning figuring out what time it rises going out seeing the vast difference of living in a temperate climate after living in a Mediterranean climate for so long um, and planting tons of golden seal, like just tucking her into the woods because that's what these woods want to grow. Um, so there's that. And um, I'm really excited about this um, collaboration I'm doing with my, my dear old friend, Dana, who is a, a dancer and, um, and kind of plant person from the, the perspective of farming, working on miso farms in Japan and like working the land and being in her body that way. Mm -hmm. And um, we are working this question around how to dance a landscape and be danced by a landscape. Mm -hmm. And she's really holding the word dancing as like, it, like dancing can mean anything. Dancing can mean just like, breathing with some sense of, of wonder and awe um, with some kind of consciousness happening there. And for me, um, being danced by a landscape is about being witnessed inside of it and not being in this one, one direction relationship of seeing and naming and knowing the uses of, but letting myself be seen. And it, it's a really subtle little like brain shift that feels like it, drops me into a reciprocal stance with my whole surroundings. Mm -hmm. So working outside, working in our bodies, in landscape, um, feels like the antidote to like living through a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, that's that's happening in person at different places. We just did a, a residency um, last weekend. We have another one in in around in bulk um, in early February, and then doing some online versions of that where we're trying to kind of break the lens of two dimensionality and be like, okay, you're in Serbia, you're in Alaska, you're in Texas, and how can we all like organize around our bodies together through? through this space, mm-hmm. kind of like you're doing. I feel like you're trying, you're breaking the, <laughs> the two dimensional lens here. So um, yeah, that just feels joyful and exciting. It's a place where my dancing self is really starting to enmesh with my plant lover self. Um, and, and also location and embodiment. I really see all these themes you've been talking about come from. Yeah. Through. Yeah, I mean, it really feels like, and, and Qigong, I mean, we mentioned, you mentioned Qigong in the beginning. Qigong feels like the practice that has really helped me understand on a deep level what it means, like how healing works through our bodies, because it's working with these macrocosmic um, images and and landscapes and then taking that into the body and yeah, I feel like my understanding, I mean, it's actually been in a way like a deep part of my herbal training is like going into Qigong, Qigong and Taoist medicine and like following the path through movement. Um, and I love actually that Qigong was like the seed of all of Taoist medicine. It started with movement mm. and it started with moving in the landscape, right? Mm. And then kind of things unwound from there. So. Um, and then there's one other thing that I'm just still loving and being really excited about that I'm doing called Healing in the Round. And it's a group clinic um, and it's online. And so there's this autonomous piece that also I feel like has been really helpful in helping people kind of be in whatever pain they're in or whatever suffering and see that they're not alone and see the the um, the kind of pathways that connect them to other people who are having really different experiences, but how like constitutions overlap and what different bodies do in different situations. Um, so it's like part herbal clinic for each individual and then part like teaching space and then part, um, yeah, it's just an interesting, it's hard because people have to actually show up and like really commit to showing up for each other. There's a, there is this witness container piece of like, we all need to show up for each other. So it feels a little bit like I have to kind of like shoulder people into being like, come on, you can do it Mm -hmm. (laughs) with me. Um, But I'm really excited about how it's um, just helping people understand their own bodies. Like I would like to get out of the way as an, as a clinical herbalist, and, and just have people understand from their own deep experience what's going on and what they need. And I feel like that that's traditional medicine mm-hmm. that that's, you know, still on the back burner. Yeah, Frida, there's just something about your offerings. It's like they don't really fit in straight lines and into a box. There's something very like fluid, dynamic and organic in the sense of just like that fluid, you know, movement. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, you have a very particular way about you and your offerings have a very particular um, energy around them that I just, I, yeah, I find very compelling. Mm, Nice. That's nice to hear. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not good with boxes. (laughs) I am really good with boxes and linear, which I think is often why I'm drawn to the, like, because I, in order to balance myself, I definitely need more inspiration of the fluidity. Well, and it's great that you are because, I mean, I had this herb business that I didn't even talk about because it's a different thing now, but I was like, okay, I just started making medicine and then people wanted it and then they're calling, you know, on my doorstep and I was like, okay, and I followed it where it wanted to go and I wouldn't ship it and I didn't want to do anything with like expanding beyond my local realm of like making medicine for the people I lived around and um, I, yeah, I was like, oh, wow, this is a box of entrepreneurship that like, I can't fit in <laughs> and, you know, finally like passed it on to other people to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like it's important to be able to fit and move through those boxes because, um, cause we can reshape them, but mm-hmm. only if we know how to be, you know, in relationship to them. Mm-hmm. 
So, yeah. Yeah. I appreciate well, thank you, you so that. much for, well, thanks for that. And thank you for all of your offerings, just all the wonderful um, energy that you put out into the world. Mm, yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. It's just what's happening. <laughs> Well, I've been kind of hemming and hawing and going back and forth on what I should ask you for your last question. I kind of <laughs> want to mix it up a little bit. And I think just I'm going to just be entirely selfish and ask what I want to hear from you. And <laughs> and I'm asking this question because we live in hard times. We could say interesting, but really hard times. And right now in the news, there's a lot of hard news there's a lot of pain and suffering mm -hmm. I feel like I've been saying that for you know almost four years now if not longer it's been kind yeah. of a, a ride and a lot of my work has been like both personally and as a teacher has been finding um, the hope and joy despite that because I don't think we can just let our souls get crushed no matter yeah. how bad it is and so that's my question for you. How do herbs in, instill hope in you or inspire hope in you in these troubled times? Mm. Can I extend it to plants? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Always. I kind of use the words interchangeably, really. Plants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Plants. Okay. Um, Which, I mean, of course, I... includes mushrooms. <laughs> Just uh -huh. We're very inclusive. We're very yes, inclusive. Yeah. yeah. And Absolutely. lichen. And yeah. lichen. Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, I, I mean, honestly, I feel like pretty much all the hope that I have in the world, I draw from the plants. Um, it comes like a direct infusion um, from my noticing and from my... Um, it feels like a, it feels like awareness can be a gift. Like it, it's a, it's the thing that we humans do really well is we can be aware and we can witness, and then we can also maybe even offer some gratitude, and then that is really beautiful. It's like the instant that I go to um, to a noticing place and an awareness place. Um, I mean, moving from California, which is so my home. I mean. It is so my home. It's where like the plants know me, you know, and I feel most myself. And moving from there as a choice for my family and for my kids to grow up outside of like evacuations and smoke and fire um, was deeply grievous. Mm -hmm. And um, there's still moments where I close my eyes and go like, oh my God, where's the redwoods? <laughs> where's mm -hmm. the bay trees? Um, but I feel like the practice of getting close and these northern great woods, as they're called, that I live in now in Western Mass, um, they require me to get close to see what's beautiful. It's not like this massive beauty that's just, you know, stunning on the coast somewhere. Um, it's really like getting close in and seeing, seeing what's happening. And it's always beautiful. And it always gives this deep sense of just like, oh, I belong here with you because I'm noticing you. Like, because I can see you and notice you, I'm needed here. Um, and really that feels like kind of like the most humble and careful stance I can take. And then it, it reflects out in other ways and in other places in my life. And um, I have a tiny story to tell. Can I tell you a tiny yes, story? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the other day, a couple of weeks ago, I'm standing outside with my tea. It's not quite freezing yet. And I'm taking a little moment in the morning, drinking my tea. And this squirrel is like hanging out nearby and kind of comes up pretty close to me, digging. And I think, I think they were maybe burying their acorns. They were the burying or checking on them. I'm not sure. Gray squirrel. And it was about three feet from me. And it looks up at me and immediately kind of stops what it's doing. It still has a little hickory nut in its mouth that looks up at me. <laughs> and I just looked at it and smiled. And it kind of skirted me for a, like a three foot radius and, and was totally interested in me for like 15 minutes. And I just stood there. My tea got cold and I was starting to shiver because it was cold out. But I just wanted to be with this little creature who was actually interested in me. And there was something about having an animal who is doing their own thing, surviving, living their lives, 
but noticing us humans and noticing me that felt so, um, so like an invitation to just be a part of the landscape. Mm -hmm. And then it ended because they, they like literally walked up to me. I was like, oh my God, what's gonna happen? Are they gonna climb up me and bite me? What's happening? And they walked up to me and just tagged me on my foot, on my left foot with mm -hmm. their little paw. And it was kind of a like, tag, you're it. <laughs> <laughs> and then scampered off. And um, yeah, that was a real like good little lesson moment. And like, mm -hmm. you matter and you're interesting. So do something interesting with your life. Hmm. Oh, yeah. beautiful, Frida. Thank you, squirrel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. this has been so lovely. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's just been wonderful to get to know you. I'm so glad that I know you're out there in the world doing the beautiful work that you're doing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Such deep questions and sharing and blessings on your on your year of grieving your dad and mm. finding your way with that. Mm, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks again, Frida. All right. Take care. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to download your beautifully illustrated recipe card and get a transcript of this show. There you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch with me. The best way to stay in touch with Frida is by signing up on her newsletter at fridacaparbay.net. If you want more herbal episodes to come your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes, and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. It takes an herbal village to make it all happen, including you. One of the best ways to retain and fully understand something you've just learned is to share in your own words. So with that in mind, I invite you to share your takeaways with me and the entire Herbs with Rosalie community. You can leave comments on my YouTube channel, on the herbswithrosaliepodcast.com show notes page, or simply hit reply to my Wednesday email. I read every single comment that comes in, and I'm excited to hear your thoughts on Angelica. Okay, you've lasted to the very end of the show, which means you get a gold star and this herbal tidbit. So we kind of touched briefly on growing Angelica and it really is a fun plant to have in your garden. And you can even grow it in a container, although I would choose a large one. This is a biennial plant, which means it takes two years to go through its growth cycle. In the first year, it puts out leaves. In the second year, it grows stalks and flowers and then it dies that fall. The flowers are beautiful. They attract a wide range of beneficial pollinators. And so it's fun to have in your garden for that reason as well. You can find Angelica seeds at places like Strictly Medicinal Seeds, and you can also look for native species at your local plant nursery, although it's best to start from seed and not a start because they don't really like to be transplanted. The fresh plant is fun to have around because you can candy the roots and stalks like the recipe that Frida has shared with us, but if you aren't able to grow Angelica yourself, you can also buy the roots for medicine making. Again, I'm looking forward to hearing your stories about Angelica.